welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Thank heavens it's Monday because Movie Talk is back. We're so glad you guys are here with us today. Lots of trailers to go over, so let's get into it. Also, we are hosts of Jedi Council, Christian Harloff. And I like flying by myself. <laughs> <laughs> also, here is Jeremy Johns. Jeremy Johns here with No Case of the Moon Days. Also, here's Mark Ellis. <laughs> Thank you to all the Collider and Schmoes fans I met in Nashville, St. Louis, and Atlanta this weekend, where I frequently fly by myself. You are going to love it, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Christian just found out that he's the only one in the Collider team flying to a certain trip we're going on by himself, and he's a little salty, but that's okay. <laughs> He'll do. He gets all the pretzels, though. You know, we get all the pretzels. I'll give you the download link to all my videos. It'll keep well, you warm actually, the entire time. No, I, I want to. I want to stay awake. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get started. Paramount Pictures will release the first trailer for Transformers The Last Night later today, the fifth film in the Transformers franchise. Directed by Michael Bay once again, the film expands the mythology of the Transformers universe by introducing a medieval backstory with Mark Wahlberg reprising his role from Transformers Age of Extinction. Transformers The Last Night opens in theaters on June 23, 2017. John, what do you think we'll see in the first trailer for Transformers The Last Night? Look, we, we've talked about it before, but here we go. The trailers actually start now. Yesterday, uh, they released like a, um, it wasn't a teaser to the trailer, but it was like this um, mon montage, if you will, of like these clips of them on set. It was Michael Bay saying, we're rap shooting. And it was like all this kind of stuff. And some of it was pretty cool to see, to, to be honest. But here we are now. The trailer's actually going to drop and we're gonna see if the pattern continues. What's the pattern we're talking about? Transformers movies put out outstanding trailers. So good, and we've talked about this before, that even though now three times in a row I have been horribly disappointed by the Transformers movies, I still defend the first one. I really like the first Transformers movie, but two, three, and four I thought have just completely choked the chicken. I do not like it at all. So <laughs> here we go, we're going into this, this one now. And what happens is every time the trailer comes out and me being the unbelievably gullible schmuck that I am, I go, you know what? I think th this one, this is the one that's going to do it. This is the one that's going to turn the boat around. And then we go and see it and I'm horribly disappointed again. And I just, look, I need, I need my friends. I need my friends because I need my friends. You know, you know that time, you know, you got a friend who's like, they always go for the wrong kind of girl, like the girl who would take advantage of whatever. And then you see your buddy starting to get together with a girl just like that. That's when the friends need to step in and pull him back off that ledge. When I see this trailer, what I need you guys at this table to do, because I know it's going to be a great trailer because that's what they do. I need you to talk me off the ledge. <laughs> but when I start going, you know what? I take it all back. I think this mythology, Nazis and Merlin, <laughs> what can go wrong when you hear me say that pull me off the ledge? I, I don't know. What are you expecting out of this thing? Um, I'm expecting, like you said, is pattern as usual. Uh, every Transformers trailers to the movie, it's like the McRib. You know, you're like, McDonald's <laughs> does ribs? Let's do it. You bite into it. You're like, what was that? What exactly is that made out of? Prove it's a rib. <laughs> right, right, right. I, no one can actually tell me what this, how I this mean, came about. I mean, it's in the shape of a rib. <laughs> it's totally a rib. You can literally match it together with your tongue you can chew oh. it down with no effort whatsoever Dog and you realize there is no substance at all yeah like daryl from the walking dead is getting sandwiches of this stuff in his kennel while he's <laughs> while he's just being tortured with that one song so uh, yeah that's what i'm expecting but i'm also expecting the continuation of the franchise that launched my youtube channel so thanks michael bay please keep pumping out garbage <laughs> i don't know like christian i look a lot of us are expecting the trailer to be to be great what are you thinking? What's going to... That trailer drops tonight. What do you think we're going to get? Here's the thing is what you said before, what you said, well, normally, and the Transformer trailer is usually good. He put out good trailers. Michael Bay usually puts out good trailers. Yeah, he does. Pearl yeah. Harbor was a great trailer <laughs> yeah, yeah, for a flying fart box of a film. <laughs> it is... he. He's got a good team. He knows how to sell his movies. And we like Transformers. We hope... It goes back to the thing like yeah. more of the person that has just he just has gone down the wrong path and there's, there's no turning back. But you're like, no, they're still good in them. That's how we feel about the Transformers. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we hope because with, with him at the helm, it's just going to be the same stuff. 
But we're talking about the trailer. What do we think we're going to get out of the trailer? I think we're going to get exactly what you said. That looks like it could be all right. Maybe this writer's room, maybe they did do something. Maybe this is actually a, a good way to spin it. And it's not going to show all the crappy dialogue and the bad slow motion and the the overexposure and all that crap. They're not going to show that. And, and the, the, the amount of uh, product placement, they're not going to show any of that in the trailer. So the trailer, yes, I think it's going to be awesome. The movie is going to be yet another stink. I just look forward to the amount of fanboy goo we are all going to be dripping <laughs> out of every pore we have because we see this trailer and we love it because this is going to be the Transformers getting back to basics, doing what the Transformers are good at doing, you know, fighting Nazis, negotiating with Winston Churchill, <laughs> singing at King Arthur's Court, the things we all pretended that we were playing with Transformers when we were a kid. I can't tell you how many conversations my Transformers had with Napoleon because that's what we love, them interacting with historical figures. How much of that are we going to get in the trailer? That's my big question. Do we see Nazis? Do we see King Arthur? Do we get to go back into those times? Or is it just a very quick, like, oh, hey, the Transformers are back? Regardless, I am over the moon about this trailer. I think the movie's going to be crap, but the trailer, I'm looking forward to it. You know, Christian, you brought up, I think, a really, really good point in, in the sense that, you know, if this, look, if the Jupiter Ascending, which is a pile of garbage, if Jupiter Ascending was a franchise and they keep putting out great trailers, to garbage movies, I wouldn't care, and I wouldn't buy into it. But down deep, we want to love the Transformers. Right. I want to love the Transformers so bad, and I think a lot of us at the table do, we want Transformers movies to work, <laughs> almost as much as we want, want to make sure Star Wars movies work. That when the trailers come up, we are really susceptible to their, you know, uh, to their persuasion, okay. if you will. So. I don't know. Let's. You know, Jeremy uh, nailed it with the McRib comparison, and I'm going to do a sports <laughs> one. It's like being a Cleveland Browns fan because every preseason <laughs> we see something happen. We're like, hey, you know, we, they kind of look good this year. It could be our year. And then the regular season starts, and then it turns into garbage, and there's zero wins on the table. I hope it's not the case, and I'm looking forward to getting my hopes up only to be crashed next year. Holy crap, they drafted Menzel. <laughs> this is Super Bowl within two years. Yeah, I, I did a little experiment with myself on my old channel. I wanted to see, I was like, I want to see if you could take a garbage movie, make it look good. I cut together a trailer uh, to Batman and Robin to see if oh, I wow. can make the movie look good. And I mean, it's seven years ago. I would have done stuff, some stuff different, but I looked at it. I'm like, Apparently, trailers don't matter because I feel like I made the movie look good. So <laughs> trailers are just, they're, they're there to sales pitch you. So that's what we get. <laughs> All right, what's next? Marvel and James Gunn released the first trailer for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Written and directed by James Gunn, the follow-up reunites Star-Lord, Gamora, Drax, Rocket, and of course, Baby Groot to battle a new threat while in search for Peter Quill's father. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 opens in theaters on May 5th, 2017. Jeremy, thoughts on the trailer for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2? The trailer to Baby Groot was adorable. I tell you, <laughs> it, it might as well be called The Adventures of Baby Groot. No, really, it, as, as far as teaser trailers go, it gave you exactly what you wanted. Some, some rocket banter, some banter with Star-Lord, Some uh, you have a good moment with Drax at the end, and you have little Baby Groot still in the show. It's exactly what a teaser trailer should show, and it showed what, uh, what we wanted to see, which is the banter among the crew. They did it well. Yeah, you know, it's been a minute since we got to remind Dennis that he missed Hall H when they did this huge presentation <laughs> for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and I'm happy everybody else got to see more of the footage that they showed us, but the, you're right, Baby Groot entirely stole this trailer. They're clearly positioning him to be, like, maybe the most purchased toy in 2016 for Christmas before the movie even comes out. This was so heavy on Baby Groot. I loved everything this trailer did. Getting to see the crew interact again I thought was brilliant. This movie is going to crush, and it's a great trailer. You know, it's funny because when the last Guardians of the Galaxy ended, they missed the boat on the baby group thing. Because you, you got that in the end scene with him dancing to the Michael Jackson beat and all that kind of stuff. There were no toys. They there did. were just no toys out there. Now, a little bit later, when they realized everybody loved that, they started to put some out, but they missed the boat. They are not missing the boat mm -hmm. this time. You know there are going to be baby Groots everywhere. About two months before this movie comes out, everything. You go to Disneyland, it's going to be plastered with baby Groot everywhere. Everything's going to be baby Groot. Now, look, I think this trailer was really good. I think it was a really good trailer. But what blew me away about it was how just entertaining it was just as a trailer. Like, I was, like, Ann and I were laying in bed, I think it was Saturday morning. Is that when it dropped? Was it Saturday morning yeah. that it came out? Yeah. So we're laying in bed, and Ann wakes me up. She goes, the, the trailer dropped, and we watched it, and then we watched it again, and we watched it again. And then I swear, for the next 20 minutes, I'm not kidding, 
for the next 20 minutes, all I did was every two or three minutes, we're laying quietly trying to go back to sleep because it's Saturday morning, we want to sleep in. And I just go, um, I am Groot. Yes. <laughs> I am Groot. Yes. <laughs> I am Groot. And Anne would crack. Like for like 20 full minutes. I don't know why. I can never make my wife laugh like that. But hey. I've heard I you are hilarious in bed. That's one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> Not something you want to hear a lot. Anyway, Kristen, what do you think about it? I love the trailer. Perry and I just did a reaction actually on, uh, you could check that out. We, it was the first time I'd seen it was today. And I held out for it and I'm glad I did. This is w gr brilliant marketing already. They have such a hold on how to market this film. They know what they have. They know what they're working with. I think what's always risky with movies like this when you put a lot of humor in there, depending on how the humor, it can come off like, oh, they're just trying to crack jokes and, and it's just, uh, you're getting away from what it's about and this was the opposite of that. The, yeah. the jokes fit because that's who these people are, the characters are. It, it, Chris Pratt promised a bigger movie in scale. It certainly looked like that from the yeah. opening shot, everything about it. You didn't get, it didn't give away a lot of plot. It just gave me exactly what I, what I wanted to see. The team that I fell in love with in the first movie doing bigger and better things and the dynamic between uh, Rocket and Baby Groot is amazing. I can't wait to see more of the comedy that they're going to have because it really is, yes, we know that they have the relationship, but we don't know the relationship he's got with Baby Groot yet yeah. and how he's got to look after Baby Groot. So I think that this is something I'm looking forward to. I love the trailer. And it's, it's cocky, too. It's arrogant. Yeah. Yes, it's it is. Brash, and, and it I needs to be. It it needs that's to be. what yeah. you want to see with Guardians of the Galaxy. You want to see them put their best foot forward. Well, you know, well, when they put the first movie out and the poster in the first movie says Guardians of the Galaxy, you're welcome, then you mm -hmm. have to kind of carry through with that a lot. I thought... The end part, like as much as this trailer was all about Baby Groot and was, and it was great and it was wonderful, that last thing with Drax and Star Lord and him, like, do me, yeah. do me. I thought I, I, just, I was laughing already through the trailer, and that just made me crack. And you know, you bring up something really important about how this trailer doesn't give a lot of the plot away. And usually, I want to see a little bit of plot. I want to know what I'm getting into. But we often forget in the, the way trailers come out so early now. This movie's still five months away. We don't need to know plot yet. We just want to get a taste. What is the flavor of this movie going to be? And, you know, right now it tastes pretty damn good. I mean, it looks really great. I thought the trailer was wonderful. All right, what's next? It's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by AMC Theaters. In a repeat from last weekend, Disney's Moana finished in the number one spot at the weekend box office for a second week in a row, taking in $28.37 million, with a domestic total just under $120 million. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them took the number two spot with $18.5 million for a domestic total of $183.5 million, marking the 10th largest release in 2016. Arrival took the number three spot with 7.3 million, with a domestic total at 73 million and 105.2 million worldwide. At number four was Allied, taking in 7 million for a domestic total of 28.9 million. And at number five was Doctor Strange. The Marvel release conjured 6.48 million, bringing its domestic total to 215.3 million. Mark, were you surprised to see Moana taking the number one spot again at the weekend box office? I was not at all, Ashley, because what do all of those movies in the top five have in common? None of them came out this week. It was not yeah. a good weekend for new movie releases. We just simply didn't have many of them. So Moana dropping 50%. It sounds like a steep drop, but it made so much money in its opening weekend, which was a family-friendly weekend to go to the movies that you would expect around a 50% drop. What impresses me the most is Arrival. It still had the least percentage drop of anything in the top five. People want to see this movie. They're talking about it. It was nice to see Allied at least make an effort to stay in the top five. So it was pretty interesting, if not that surprising to have Moana beat Fantastic Beast for the second week in a row. Yeah, and a 50% drop isn't bad. Well, actually, that's kind of where you want it to be. You're hoping you have 50% or less. If you get 50% or less, I think technically it was like 49.9% drop. That's kind of where you want your movie to be. It's doing really well for them, and it's I'm really happy for it because, like I said before, I think to me it's the best animated film of the year. My personal opinion, other people have others. Uh, Fantastic Beasts, well, the you know, there's no more debate. It is financially successful. It's already made over $600 million worldwide already it'll probably get to seven for the first film in this new kind of run at the franchise so they got to be really happy about that and uh, once again dr strange i think dr strange is now this trippy weird kind of movie 634 million dollars worldwide already that's only going to go up a little bit more so overall i thought it's a 
pretty expected. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, uh, and like you said about Fantastic Beasts uh, some weeks ago, it is about the sequel. Because everyone went yeah. and saw the first one, but we'll see how the sequel does. Because, I mean, The Hangover was like the number one rated R movie, or one of the, not number one, but in the top three uh, financially successful rated R movies of all time. Uh, Hangover 2 also did well. Hangover 3 did not. So, yeah, yeah we'll see how it goes. But, uh, yeah, I love the fact that Arrival's creeping up. I love that. Like Mark said, if there is one weekend that you could say that weekend was going for the Oscar, it was last weekend, my <laughs> friends. And if, it, if my hits on my reviews have anything to say about it, people don't really care about those movies that came out last weekend. So uh, it was going to be about the movies that were already pretty existing. Like I say, never underestimate the power of the animated kids movie. Moana's crushing. Fantastic Beasts is making its money. Doctor Strange is still in the top five. Um, I'm actually surprised that Allied is holding on, but given this last weekend, I probably shouldn't be, but I'm really glad Arrival's still getting some shine. Um, I think the first thing that stands out is the conversation we had a couple of weeks ago about Disney and how they are going to surpass the all-time box office for the yeah. year. Mm. Because at the time, Moana and Doctor Strange hadn't come out. Well, they are, and like John just said, pretty dominant numbers already, and they still have a little movie coming out pretty soon here called Rogue One. What's that? It's going to cap it out. Rogue One is this movie with uh, Jar Jar Binks. Is, that, is that the Star uh, Troops? Well, yeah, the Star Troops. So we, uh, but so those are the ones. The, the Moana and Doctor Strange are the f first two to stand out. Like you guys said, it's, it's leading up to the really big release of Rogue One that's coming out. So people are kind of waiting. The only kids movie really out right now um, for everyone of all ages is Moana. And then you can kind of make a play for a fantastic piece. But it is a rival that kind of stands out the most to me because, it, in essence, it's an independent film. It, 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 real, it really is, with the studio backing as far as releasing. But if you look at the budget and everything, too, the way that that movie was, was made in general, it's a, um, it's a brilliant film. It's, pro it, 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 it's between one and three. I don't know where to place it yet in my, in my top for the year. I loved the movie. Very happy that it's doing as well as it is. And uh, I think once Oscar season comes out and they kind of keep it out there in January, I think more people will see it because I think it's going to get a couple nods come Oscar season. And I don't know if we knew this already, but Jimmy Kimmel was announced as the host of the Oscars. I don't know if anybody knew yeah, that. that's a topic for another time. I Just think. kidding. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, we reached that part of the show for buy and sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So Ashley, what do we got? According to a report from THR, Amy Schumer is in negotiations to star in Sony's live action Barbie movie. The story will be in the vein of Splash and Enchanted, in which the main character is kicked out of Barbie land for not being perfect enough and lands in a real world adventure. A search is on now for a director with a release date targeted for summer of 2018. Christian Byersell, Amy Schumer in Sony's live action Barbie movie. Yeah, I'm going to sell it. Um, and, you know, he, here's here's the thing. I think that if you're going to approach it this way and you're going to go after Amy Schumer, who's hot right now, Trainwreck was good. She and, and like I said, I'm not a fan of Amy Schumer, but I, I can't take away that. I thought Trainwreck was very well written. I thought she did a great job with the movie. Um, and this is an interesting take. So I, I, I can applaud them for going down this route. This is just something I would never want to watch. I'm going to have to watch it because we're going to have to review it. But it's just, it's just not for me. And I think that it could be an absolute disaster or depending on the right director and how they get the script done, it could be a surprise hit. Because I'm not, And I'll go back in time when we were talking about Bridesmaids. Mm -hmm. And I said, this sounds like nothing I want to see. And I wound up loving that film. So this could be an interesting change. But as of right now, selling it. Jeremy. Yeah, that's interesting that you say bridesmaids because that does make me back up and go, oh well. But if I if I'm going on uh, what I see right now, I'm going to sell it too. It's uh, I mean I think Amy Schumer is talented. Uh, I just I, I think the the premise is to like bar the whole Barbie beauty thing has been a thing on uh, on an issue with uh, kids and moms for quite some time. It's been a social issue for a bit, but it's so on the nose about it. Like we're going to make a movie about that premise, right. and not just that. I I am not a fan of the Smurfs going from their land and going in a real world adventure. It's just the premise itself is not something that I have generally liked. Maybe this will be the first one that I like, but as I stand right now, I gotta sell it. But it, it, it's a premise that worked for Enchanted. You know, that, I mean, that was a movie that I think worked really well and it kind, kind of had that idea. I agree, with the Smurfs, not so much. Mm -hmm. But with Enchanted, it did. I'm gonna buy this and, and here's why. Number one, I'm not a big Amy Schumer fan, but I really did like Trainwreck. I think she, like Christian said, I think she did a really great job on that. And I found it very fun and very entertaining. But look, I, I don't have kids. And if I did, maybe I have a 50% chance of one would be a daughter. All right. 
this has been brought up, mm -hmm. you know, that Barbie portrays an image of girls that you have to be absolutely perfect, you have to be physically perfect, you have to be all that kind of stuff, or else you don't have value. And that's been a discussion, but it's never really been tackled in movies. As a matter of fact, when you look at a lot of the movies, and what's the one Freddie did, that Freddie Prince Jr. did with, uh, is it She's All That? She's is that All That. Yeah, She's yeah. All right? <laughs> Whenever you get these movies, or whether it's, uh, what's the princess one? Um, uh, with with with, uh, with with the girl who played Cat Catwoman Diaries. Why am I forgetting? Yeah, Princess, Princess Diaries. Diaries. Yeah. Anne look Hathaway. At, yeah, Anne Hathaway. When you're looking Great at any Oscar of these host, movies, by the way. yeah. When you're looking <laughs> at when you're looking at any of these movies where it's like the ugly girl. No, it's not. By the end of the movie, she's super hot and, and gorgeous. It's just that she had glasses and wasn't doing her hair right. Mm -hmm. I think the idea of a studio <laughs> stepping in and saying, you know what? Let's actually make a movie about this premise. Let's actually take a shot at this. I think it's interesting. It could end up being a disaster. No doubt. There is a lot of potential in here for being a disaster, but I for one applaud them for at least taking a shot at this to make a movie about this, something we've all talked about before, but no studio has been willing to step, step out, put their neck out, and actually make a message movie about it for kids and for young girls. I think it could be a very important movie. Or it could absolutely suck, but for now I'm going to buy it. Yeah, I'm going to buy it too. I mean, this movie is not going to be a critical darling, and I don't think they need it to be. I think that this is something that if you're going to make a Barbie movie, you're going to slap that product name on a movie poster, it's going to make money. And so it's nice that Mattel and Barbie are like, well, let's, we might as well do something positive with this movie, make it a nice message about empowering all groups of people. So if you have Amy Schumer be the one that has to go through this adventure, is she my favorite actress on earth? I don't know. I liked her in Trainwreck, and that's about it. She's fine in Bud Light commercials. I'd like to see more of that. And a I lot like those of her, a lot of her stand up is around it, it get very dirty and can get very raunchy, but also it can have a message about empowering all women, so that's why she's the right choice for this. I'm not saying she's going to be great in it, but as far as a marketing strategy goes, I think this makes sense for a movie that isn't really aiming itself at my demographic anyway, so I'm just gonna be an innocent bystander watching this. Whereas with the Smurfs, I wanted to see them stay in the Smurf Village because I wanted to hang out in Smurf Village. I don't really want to hang out in the Barbie Dream House. So I like to see more of an enchanted style adventure which is what we're going to get with this and you know the other thing about this too is that this sounds like if we stood back and heard like a movie what i would not like about this at all is that they're making a barbie movie where the message to young girls is you don't have to be perfect you know like there's you are beautiful the way you are but it scar stars scarlett johansson or because that's normally what the hollywood thing would be and in that sense, Amy Schumer's kind of the right person to do it. See, I'd love to see a G.I. Joe movie where there's like a guy like me who's the G.I. Joe and they kick him out because like I look like me. And I'm like, come on, I can do some stuff too. And then I win the day. I was just saying that. I was like, so that's the lesson. Get your daughter G.I. Joe's. Get your daughter G.I. My G. sister Joe's used to place. have her Barbies hook up with my G.I. Joe's. So maybe we could have a shared universe one day. And knowing is half the battle. All right, what's next? Universal Pictures debuted the first full trailer for The Mummy last night online during Sunday Night Football. The movie stars Tom Cruise, Sofia Boutella, Annabella Wallace, Jake Johnson, Courtney B. Vance, and Russell Crowe as Dr. Jekyll. The movie is directed by Alex Kurtzman and set to open in theaters on June 9, 2017. John Byers held the first trailer for The Mummy. You know what? It was different from what I thought it was going to be. It was different from what I thought it was going to be. I'm, I'm going to buy the trailer. I, I'm not jumping up and down. I'm, actually, Jeremy and I were in a sports bar last night watching the football <laughs> game in the trailer. It's like, hey, man, look, this is the mummy trailer. We watched it. I was like, all right, that was, that was okay. There's some things in there. It is obviously a big departure from the old mummy franchise. But, and, and I'm just waiting for the stories to come out that, you know, Tom Cruise actually strapped himself into a plane that was falling out of the sky for that stunt. Um, <laughs> thank you. You know, that story's coming out pretty soon. But I, I you know what? It was, uh, it was a decent trailer. I'm intrigued by it, so for me, it's a buy. It was the second scariest thing the Carolina Panthers saw last night. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you all. Man. Thank you all. Uh, this is a buy for me, man. I dug this trailer. It was, it was exciting just on a, on a fanboy level to see something like The Mummy. You know it's a Mummy trailer as soon as you see Tom Cruise sitting in the plane. What I didn't like about this trailer, and the only thing that I think of when I remember this trailer now, is hearing Tom Cruise scream. I, I'm not saying I would have fared any better in that situation, but he's got a weird scream, and he did it multiple times as that plane was going down, and I don't think I've ever heard Tom Cruise scream before. Yeah. Has there ever been a movie? He runs in every movie. You know, he smiles in every movie. I don't think I've ever heard the guy scream, and it's a little off-putting. Um, yeah, I'm going to tentatively buy it. I think that what it's, it's definitely a different take on the Mummy movies, for sure. 
I don't, you can see Tom Cruise's stamp all over this movie. Like it, it yeah. looks like every action movie that he's done so far, and you're basically taking the fun of the Tom Cruise action movie and putting it in the Mummy, and that's why I'm buying it, and it's why I'm almost selling it because it makes me a little nervous because it's just going to be the same type of movie we've been seeing from him over and over again. This time, there's mummies in it. Cause I also felt a little bit of. Um, What's the Da Vinci Code in there a little bit too? I don't know why I felt that, but I you're it right. Felt, it did it have felt, a little bit of that flavor, didn't it? A little bit it? like that, but I actually am buying, even though she's not in it that much, because of Sofia Boutella. Um, she is a superstar, man. I'm telling you, like between Kingsman and then I thought she was the best thing in Star Trek Beyond. She is great, so I hope that she has a lot more to do than just kind of having th- three or four eyes and, and kind of dancing around and making creepy faces. I hope she actually does more, and there's there's more story to her. But I'm gonna. I'm. I'm actually. I'm rooting for this franchise. Also, I want it to be a good franchise. This new monster universe. Yeah, I want this whole monster universe to work. So I'm buying it for hope. I think it succeeded on that level too, because as an announcement trailer, we're not only got to see one of the biggest movie stars ever, Tom Cruise, in a mummy franchise. They also gave us a nice juicy take on Russell Crowe in this film as well. So we're clearly watching this as fans being like, wow, they got a lot of stars. They're really taking this thing seriously. It's going to be a shared universe. So I think it was an exciting first trailer. Jeremy. Yeah, when, uh, when you talk about her dancing around, you're thinking about the witch from uh, Suicide Squad, dude. You thought, <laughs> like, you thought she was <laughs> gone? She's gone. She's not gone. Uh, but yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I agree with you that I didn't know Russell Crowe was playing, uh, I guess he's playing Dr. Jekyll. Didn't mm-hmm. know that. And so setting up the universe, I think it was a fine first trailer to show you because everything has to be a universe now everything has to be a super connected the marvel cinematic universe <laughs> slash star wars universe slash now monsters universe but uh, I, I i did think that it did a good job i do agree with you mark that his scream is weird it's because we've never it's heard it. i think when the plane's yeah. going down i think he should have been stoic as ah! it's diving and he's like <laughs> two things are gonna happen go in to the next Southern 10 Towers. seconds <laughs> one exactly. this plane is gonna <laughs> and he just dies and then he gets raised because i I guess he's dead. He looked good for a dead guy who just died and burned in a plane crash. I'm yeah, not, there was some plastic. Lie. Actually, all the body, you could see through the plastic in the body. Bags. They're like, fine. None of those guys yeah. looked like they were just in a horrible plane crash. <laughs> they looked like fairly they're in okay shape. All right, what's next? Warner Brothers and DC Films have finally set a release date for their standalone debut of Jason Momoa's Aquaman. Per deadline, the film is now set to open on October 5th, 2018 in both 3D and IMAX. The Conjuring and Furious 7 Helmer James Wan will direct the film about the King of Atlantis, who will make his proper debut in 2017's Justice League, directed by Zack Snyder. Mark Byersell, Aquaman's new release date on October 5th, 2018. Uh, I'll buy any release date you want to give me for Aquaman, and it shows some level of confidence, too, that they're giving it an October release date, and it's not in the more dumping ground when we expect the movie to come out in January and February. The studio is putting a lot into this movie, and it's going to pay off. Look at what Doctor Strange was able to do in a similar release time that came out the first weekend in November this is the first weekend in October so you're getting away from that summer blockbustery movies but to have something land right here it's a great spot for Aquaman it's an interesting release date I'm gonna buy it mostly though admittedly just because I'm just w- was waiting for a release date mm-hmm. I think I've been this is maybe the standalone other than Batman this is the standalone movie from them I've really been curious to see because it their take on Aquaman look, right now looks Fantastic, but October is a very odd date. I cannot recall, I don't know if you guys can think off the top of your head, but the last major comic book movie to be released in October. It is an odd one for me, just like you know Deadpool being released in February, but maybe it's a stroke of genius. Maybe they know there's not gonna be a lot of blockbuster action happening in October. Maybe they see it as an opportunity. Hopefully, it is a sign of confidence, so for me, it's gonna be a buy. Yeah, I feel like they're gonna do that like every six month offset, but not compete with the Marvel movies. Like, Marvel movies come out here and here, and then DC movies come out here and here, and hopefully everybody wins. It's, re- it's really funny. I look at this. I'm going to buy it, not just the release date, but the fact that it's Aquaman. A few years ago, I wouldn't have. And then I read Jeff Johns' Aquaman, and Jeff Johns made Aquaman awesome. Not so different, no relation to myself, different guy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he... He made him, he really showed that Aquaman, Arthur Curry, is a man of two worlds, and there is conflict there. And that internal conflict and political conflict with Jason Momoa's intensity, I'm looking forward to Aquaman. It's just like, I'm looking forward to these DC movies. I really am. It's like, um, I'm looking forward to Wonder Woman. I'm looking forward to the standalone Batman. And I'm looking forward to Aquaman. Apparently, I'm looking forward to the DC movies coming out. Christian. It is a very, very smart move. And I'll tell you why I think that, just because it's, the real, I think when we went to rewind a couple of 
days ago, whatever, weeks ago, we talked about how November 10 years ago wasn't the way that it's shaped now. Right, yeah. We're cons- where we are constantly changing the dynamic, especially with all these comic book movies and Star Wars movies. Remember, December wasn't the biggest movie to ever open up before Force Awakens was like 86 million and it was Harry Potter. Now you have a Star Wars movie that is essentially opening every December. It looks like they're going to corner that. You're going to have Han Solo out that year, so they want to stay away from that. You have Fantastic Beasts 2 going to be in November. You kind of want to stay away from that. In the summertime, you're going to have the Avengers and Ant-Man. Stay away from those. Why? But in October, nobody's there. Nobody's around in October, so if, if maybe they're trying to corner a new, a new market there, too. And it's also the first movie. Similar to what Guardians of the Galaxy did when they dropped in August the first time. It's the end of the summer. Can we build some momentum for a movie that not a lot of people know? And Aquaman's a little different. You know, it's, it's, it, he's, got, he's got a history, but then you have James Wan. he got Momoa. Recognizable from Game of Thrones, but not the biggest star yet. But if you can really make it pop in October and you can do something with that and stamp it, maybe that's your new battleground in October. And then when the movie does really well, then you release it, the sequel in like July or even December or something. I think it's a really smart move. Yeah, because right now, I mean, <clears throat> whether you're a defender of the DC films up to this point like myself or somebody who hates them, other studios are not afraid of the DC movies. They're not afraid. They're, other studios are not in a place where they're thinking, we've got to avoid the DC movies. But... If Wonder Woman comes out and is as good as the trailers are suggesting it is, if Justice League comes out and they correct a lot of the mistakes that they made with Batman versus Superman, suddenly you're going to have another major player in the game. You're going to have other students. You're going to have, because right now Marvel's like, we don't care when DC movies are dropping, we're going to put our movies where we want. But if Wonder Woman can come out and do some damage, and if Justice League can come out and do some damage, other studios are going to start taking notes about when DC drops their films. It's just not that case right now. We'll see how that turns out. Okay, what's next? All right, Adam, pull up that spoiler alert because we're about to talk about (laughs) Spider-Man's costume. So if you want to remain in the dark about it, plug your ears, close your eyes. You've been warned. (laughs) At the recent Comic-Con Experience 2016 in Brazil, a short clip from John Watts' Spider-Man Homecoming debuted, and in it featured an upgrade to Spidey's suit that looks to now include the -the under-the-arm web wings from the classic comics. The description of the footage, thanks to Omelette, shows John Favreau's Happy Hogan asking if Tom Holland's Peter Parker received a package from Tony Stark. The next scene shows Spider-Man on top of a building with the new upgraded wingsuit. Jeremy, buy or sell Spider-Man's costume with the classic web wings. I'll buy it. As a, a, I mean, huge Spider-Man fan here. I always prefer to suit without the web wings because the web wings kind of look like he had a hygiene problem. It's like weird armpit hair <laughs> under. That's a, that's a weird problem you got there, kid. Sorry, sorry it happened. I guess there has to be a drawback to that radioactive spider biting you. But uh, I mean, I, I'll buy it though because regardless as to whether or not I prefer one or the other, Visually, it will take me back to a time of Spider-Man Prime when Spider-Man was great before he had some of the cinematic problems he ran into before Tom Holland took up the helm. So I'm going to buy this. Uh, I, I, I think the whole thing looks great. It does make me wonder if uh, it, this is an upgrade to the Tony Stark suit. Did he, did he just look at it like, yeah, Mr. Stark had the right idea, but webbing in my armpits right there because he's not going to fly with that you look like if he jumps off a building he's going to go bap I'm like, well that sucks those aren't big enough to be wings it's just as a visual aesthetic so it does make me wonder why it happened but sure i'll buy it christian yeah, i'm going to buy it because i think it's it sounds like it's serving the story and that's that to me is i because tony stark in every movie is like always upgrading his suit or wanting to do new things to his suit so it makes sense that he would want to help this kid out and give him some well, try this you know i've been working on this maybe use this suit instead as opposed to him going uh eh, we didn't really like the last suit let's just try to switch it up a little bit there weren't any complaints about complaints about the civil war suit really i don't think that there were so it wasn't them going oh the fans didn't dig that one let's change it up it serves the story so i dig it that's why I buy it as well, is because Tony Stark, and I know that, that it's it's a totally different universe from what we got with the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies or the Amazing Spider-Man films, but you know there's a little sense of competition that we need to do something different with the suit that we never showed in any of those movies, which is why you would want to have Web Wings involved. And Christian makes a great point. Tony Stark, being such a the tinker that he is, he's going to create new things for Spider-Man's suit. So it makes sense to me in the service of the tale. It'll be interesting to see if it serves the story. I don't think Tony doing something to it in and of itself says it serves the story. I, I'm going to sell it only because, just because, 
I do, like you, I prefer the look of it without mm -hmm. the web wings and that. But don't think they couldn't be useful. Because, you know, a lot of movies, they've been getting into using those, you know, the skydivers who have, like, the squirrel yeah. outfits that they yeah. can make it simulate like they're flying? Mm -hmm. Maybe those will serve that purpose. I'm hoping to. But just on the basis, only on the basis of, do I prefer the look without the webbing or with the webbing? I prefer without the webbing. So just for now, I'm going to sell it. We'll see how they actually function in the movie. All right, guys, we, listen, we do this show live every day, and as such, we like to save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take some of your live Twitter questions. How can you get a Twitter question on? Simple. Make sure you're following us at Collider Video. Make sure you're following us on Twitter and start sending in your questions now, and Wendy will pick out a couple questions that we can address at the end of the show. I also remind you that Movie Talk is not the only show on Collider Video today. A brand new crash course just went up. Listen, one of the key things in this new Star Wars Rogue One movie is kyber crystals. Why? Why is that important? Watch Ken Knapsack describe why it's so important and their history in the Star Wars universe and the newest crash course. That's up right now. Also, a brand new Walking Dead recap went up last night and a little bit later today, the new episode of TV Talk goes up. All right, guys, with that out of the way, it's time for Mailbag. Look, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Ashley, what's in the mailbag? Samuel Stevens writes, what do you all think about the trailer for Collateral Beauty? I think it looks like a fake movie like the one in Tropic Thunder. Could this <laughs> secretly be a parody like The Happening? And how on earth did the movie <laughs> assemble such a great cast? Will Smith, <laughs> Helen Mirren, Naomi Harris, Ed Norton, Kira Knightley, Kate Winslet? Well, I, okay, this is the, look, I'm always saying the best thing about movies, the absolute best thing about movies is that they are so subjective and we can all look at the same movie and have a completely different experience. Sometimes good, sometimes bad, whatever. Personally, I can't relate. I think the trailer looks awesome. Like the whole idea about a, a crushed and broken man being visited by, by the manifestations of love, time, and death and how it relates to him and having lost his daughter looks heartbreaking. There's there's mixture of tragedy with fantasy with a whole bunch of stuff. And like you bring up, how did it get this cast? I can only assume it's because the script must be really good to attract that level of cast. Now look, we've seen movies with great casts turn out to be bad for absolutely. But personally for me, I think this movie looks wonderful. I'm very excited to see it. What about you? Uh, Samuel, you just blew my mind with that question. I'll, I'll tell you why you have a great cast. Maybe because the script's good, or maybe because it just reeks of Oscar bait where there's multiple opportunities to have an award level performance, which is not a bad thing. And I saw the trailer and I was yeah. impressed too. I really want to see this movie. But I don't know that you could ever do, I'd love to see a studio attempt this, where you release a movie and every trailer is serious in tone and it comes out and it ends up being a spoof movie or a comedy. <laughs> I don't know that's ever happened before. Now there's been serious movies that end up being things we laugh at. Like the most glaring example to me is The Wicker Man, where Nicolas Cage oh in the gosh. second half of the that bees, movie. The bees, the bees! It's just, it's totally hilarious unintentionally. But what if you did that? If you made like a Tropic Thunder movie and it looked like it was serious, and then it was actually a spoof movie. Somebody do that. Jeremy. Yeah, I, I think Collateral Beauty, Beauty looks great. I, I have a sauce, but it, it's kind of like the uh, um, uh, the Christmas Carol, you know? Right. Where yeah. anytime there's a spirit that comes to someone, like different spirits of some sort that show someone a little something that's broken inside them or what they're missing, and they kind of find fulfillment as a person. I have a soft spot for that. It works for Christmas Carol for me. It's, it's I mean, it's the beloved holiday classic. Neil Gaiman's The Books of Magic is kind of like Christmas Carol, but for magic, where this kid is going to be a sorcerer, and so John Constantine and a couple others showing the past, present, and future of magic. And so it just, uh, this looks like to carry on that tradition, again, with the acting and the cast. I mean, the cast they have, I agree with you. It's like, how'd they get them? Probably, I, I don't think the money is the thing. I don't think right. any of these people are going to be like, yeah, I'll sign on to a piece of garbage, you know, for the money. So um, everything lines up. The stars are aligning for me to love this, and I have no reason to not. Christian. I think that the answer to how they got a lot of these stars is look at when it's being released because it's being released at the end of December. There's a lot. It's you look at it like a career with an actor and actress, especially someone like Ed Norton who's making a climb back, and he was he had a lot of recognition with uh, Birdman, Birdman recently, and he got and he got not uh, nominated for for the movie, and Will Smith d got snubbed last year. Um, so. It, this time period, this is like okay. This could be a pitch for this is the this is the script that came in. This is the movie we think is going to be able to get the Oscar noms. The agent goes, we think this is one that's going to get some noms. You should do it. Don't worry about the normal asking price. We'll come down a little bit because they're going to push it pretty hard come Oscar season. And that's how you get a lot of these 
Oscars, right? Uh, excuse me, a lot of actors who are probably in contention. I actually agree with the rest of the panel here. I think that it looks really good. I think it could be very interesting. I, Christmas Story is exactly what I thought yeah. of right away. Uh, not Christmas Story, Christmas Car Carol. Yeah. Uh, Christmas Story would be a, that, that would be a parody. <laughs> if it was actually a, 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 a remake. And <laughs> Edward Norton right there goes, "You're going to shoot your eye out, kid." Um, <laughs> but overall, I'm looking forward to the movie. Uh, I think that the only reason it would be interesting to see what you were pitching, but the problem is you piss so many people off. I know, but yeah. but what a what a gag, man! Let's do it. <laughs> Helen Mirren sticks her tongue on a frozen flagpole. That I'll <laughs> yeah. just completely lose it. All right, guys, I said we'd save some time for your Twitter questions, and we're gonna do that right now. Wendy, what have you picked out? First one comes from Mass Effect fan X, who writes, "What do you think of George Lucas's reaction to Rogue One?" Look. Uh, George Lucas's sensibilities when it comes to the Star Wars movies today obviously are a bit in question, but apparently he loved it. And so, I mean, I don't care who it is. If it's somebody whose opinion I really do respect or somebody whose opinion I don't, I love hearing people say that they really loved a movie. That's great to me. So to me, it's an encouraging thing. Christian, what do you think? Uh, yeah, it's always... you. Every Star Wars movie that's come out is going to be endorsed by George Lucas, even though, because remember, yeah, he had his comments like behind closed doors later on that came out about Force Awakens, but initially when he saw it, oh, I was a big fan of it. Uh, <laughs> and, and now the same thing with Rogue One, and I think that it, cause it, it ties in a little bit more to that first creation that he ever brought on the screen in Episode Four. but you're always, this is, we're going to talk about this every year. George Lucas says he loves Han Solo. George Lucas says he loves Episode Eight. Oh, George Lucas' thoughts on this, it's, it's, it's part of it. He's the creator. He's the guy. Because if he didn't say anything, oh, George Lucas isn't talking about Rogue One at all. What, is, what does that mean? Is he, is, he, is he mad at Disney? Is he mad at Lucasfilm? So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a non-story, but it's always an interesting take to hear the creator talk. Jeremy. Jeremy. Yeah, this is the way I see George Lucas, and credit where credit's due, the dude's a good world builder in his head. The guy is imaginative. That doesn't mean he's a good writer slash director. I really think that George Lucas has or had a vision in his head for what Star Wars should be, but kind of like, it's like me, if I have a landscape in my head, I can't draw it how I see it in my head. I think that's just his problem. He can't portray on screen that world that he has built in his head. However, if there was an artist that I uh, that just drew a landscape that I had in my head and said, hey, is this what you're talking about? I'd be like, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I love that. I really think that's George Lucas's thing. The dude has has a vision in his head of something that's really good. He can't portray it, but if he sees someone portray it well, he's going to say it. So in a world of, I think everyone's being honest, I'm glad. I'm glad the dude gets to see his world carried to the hopeful glory that he wanted it uh, wanted to see it in all fairness george lucas at some point in his career was really good at taking that picture in his head yes, and he putting was. it on the screen exactly the way we all wanted to see it which is why i'm excited about this yeah there's probably two roads you can take with george lucas as far as a disney a star wars movie coming out a he's going to like it or b he's gonna say i didn't see it He's not going to be super <laughs> critical about a Star Wars movie before it comes out. There's probably some contractual things that go down when you get $4 billion from a company where maybe you don't crap on a movie before it comes out. Having said all that, I love these comments. I love this stuff because it's something Christian brought up is that this movie is so closely tied to his baby, to Star Wars A New Hope from all the way back in 1977 when that movie came out. And it pretty much ends where that movie starts. So for George Lucas to watch this movie in 2016 and say, I like what that did because it feels like it ties into his movie. That makes me think if that is that much like a new hope, I'm going to love this movie and I'm more optimistic for Rogue One because of it. You know what I do like though too in those comments because there's also an interview with Gareth Edwards about how he talked to when George Lucas went and watched the movie and he, and he said to him, oh, you should use more CGI computers. He's totally joking around. Yeah, and kidding. Yeah. I love that he's kind of poking fun yeah. at himself and he's poking fun at them. Some people took it seriously he was kidding yeah. and I love that he was kidding the fact that he knows that there's a big push now on shooting in real locations and not everyone responded to the computers and he poked fun at it so and he's, he's not a guy that usually pokes fun I at know it, but so. he's been getting good at because remember recently like recently it was a year or two ago he's walking around with the Han shot first yeah, yeah, t-shirt yeah, yeah, on yeah, yeah. I kind of dig that all right <laughs> what's get, next oh sorry I was just gonna say you guys remember when James Cameron said Terminator Genesis was good <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. 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 All right. What's next? Thanks, Jeremy. All right. Next one comes from Louis Garza, who writes thoughts on Jimmy Kimmel being the host for the 2017 Oscar. 
Um, I'm okay. I'm a little. I'm a little bit torn because y if you've watched me for any period of time, you know that I generally like movie personalities hosting the biggest night of the movie year. However, I'm a big fan of Jimmy Kimmel. I think the dude's really funny and hilarious. I always watch his after Oscar show. His after Oscar show is always one of the highlights to me. Do you remember when he did the Handsome Club? Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorite after Oscar <laughs> things of all. If you haven't seen the Handsome Club. With Jimmy Kimmel, the after Oscar thing, look it up on YouTube. It's it's fantastic. So I'm going to go in optimistic. Yeah, um, I mean, as the default optimist, I'm going to also. Look, I mean, Billy Crystal's the greatest host the Oscars have ever had. We can't get him every time. We probably can't get him again if we get him maybe once once or twice more. Uh, that being said, um, my knee-jerk reaction was like, Jimmy Kimmel's a little dry. But then in thinking about it, Anytime I've seen him host something, I've liked it. So there's no reason for me not to like this. I like Kimmel, so yeah. I thought it's a great choice. I think that he did a great job with the Emmys, and I think that uh, he was. It, there's only so much any host can do mm -hmm. because the format lends itself to no matter who it is, you get tired after a while. It's a long show, and there's after a while, it's it's the opening bit. How's the opening bit going to be? And I think it's going to be pretty good with him. I think he's going to have, have a lot of fun. He's got a lot of celebrity friends that can make it pretty interesting up top. You know Matt Damon will make an appearance probably pretty soon, but there's so much that he does now, and he's and, he, and he's also he's in touch with with all generations. I mean, he really is. He's one of him and, and Fallon are guys who kind of jumped on they, they know how to use YouTube. They know how to use um, viral marketing. He's a smart dude, and I think that this is going to be something that's a lot of fun. And I don't think it's going to be mean-spirited. I think that there'll be some... You know, some ribs, but I think overall it's going to be a good show. And he's a great choice for that reason exactly. Is that Jimmy Kimmel's the guy who can have fun with roasting style humor, but it never gets to the nasty Ricky Gervais level, which I really appreciate, but it would turn off a lot of people in the room. That is one of the hardest rooms in comedy to get that room united at the beginning of the show and to get them all laughing at the same thing and sometimes poking fun at themselves. And Jimmy Kimmel has proved himself to be a master of that. Not only has he been great at hosting shows before, but he also does a nightly talk show where he comes out and delivers a monologue every evening. He's in shape to do this. I think he's going to crush it as long as the producers don't get in the way. That's my big problem with the Oscars sometimes is that they overproduce it. I thought they sucked all the air out of what could have been a great Ellen DeGeneres performance host the Oscars. They didn't allow her the room to do that. You've got to allow Jimmy Kimmel the room to do his thing. If they're able to do that, I think it's going to be a great show. All right, guys, that'll do it for us for this installment of Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, Christian Harloff, where can people find you? You can find me, Christian Harloff, on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm going to start talking about it now. December 23rd is the Schmodown Spectacular. Five matches in one video, three title matches with the headliner, Mark Baby Caratella, sitting over there going up for the title against Dangerous Dan Merle. Put it on your calendar. Sitting right beside me is Mr. Jeremy Johns. You can find me at Jeremy Jones on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, at Real Jeremy Jones on Facebook, and here four days a week because I love you all. We're over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. You can find me Saturday, the premiere for a movie starring a space monkey. I'm very excited about it. <laughs> Leading up to that, of course, you're going to have the Schmoes No Live show. Chris and I are both back this Thursday, and you can find me on Twitter at Mark Ellis Live. I'm not there. Ashley Mova. <laughs> Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And, of course, Wendy Lee. You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, at Wendy Lee Zaney. Uh, you, of course, can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter, simply at John Campia. And like these guys said, a couple of us are going to be going to the world premiere of Rogue One on Saturday. Make sure you're tuned in to, first of all, our Collider video, Instagram, to all of our social medias. We are going to be doing a lot of pictures, a lot of video. We are going to take you along with us to this incredible event. Keep your eyes open for that. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, Bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.